John Bauer was born in Jan Serping in 1882 as the son of a German butcher, Joseph Bauer, and his wife, Emma Waddell. The father came from a family of farmers and craftsmen in Bavaria and migrated to Sweden in 1863. Like his brothers, Joseph first worked as a brewer. In 1867, he settled in Yonder, where he ran an extensive delicatessen business. John was the middle of three brothers. His older brother, Yelmar, also had a marked artistic aptitude. In school, John's grades were sloppy, and his notebooks were more filled with drawings than with academic exercises. His first drawings show a precision in line, and his small comic figures, which certainly amused his schoolmates, testified to his sense of humor and great imaginative ability. Schoolmates and teachers were often depicted in his caricature drawings. When John had to accompany his parents on trips, he carried his sketchbooks to draw landscapes and churches. This was when he was only eight years old. Taking inspiration from satirical cartoons, especially from the drawings of Albert Engstrom, at the age of about 12, his caricatures became more interesting. John's artistic talent was clear to the family early on, and there was never any doubt that John would train as an artist. The family was supportive of his career choice and also financially supportive as well. The family were successful, owning a house, vacationing to seaside resorts, and father providing international contacts. The family socialized and lived in a safe atmosphere. Traveling to Stockholm for the art academy, he was just 16 when he began his education. John's matriculation there was apparently stunted though because of his age. In the meantime, he attended Alton's School of Painting, a preparatory school where a number of young, talented artists gained tutelage from the painter Caleb Alton. Along with Engstrom, he was particularly attached to Carl Larson's painting with its fresh, immediate representation of nature and its clean line. During these early years of his education, according to the custom of the time, he devoted himself mainly to drawing from models. During winter 1899, John made a series of depressive pictures with titles such as The Despair and The Return of the Prodigal Son. In his letters home, traces of despair and uncertainty can be seen, possibly due to the fact that he was not accepted as a student at the Academy of Arts that year. But at the beginning of 1900, with only three openings available, John was accepted into the Academy. During the first year at the Academy and during the summer of 1901, John diligently studied costume at the Nordic Museum and at the Royal Library, and also details in nature, making an entire series of line drawings of flowers, trees, and forests. His nature and model studies were soon noted by both teacher and peers as very gifted. Professor Gustav Sederstrom, himself a famous painter known for his historical paintings and royal commissions, commented particularly about John's smaller sketches, comparing his work with the so-called monumental painters, calling John's work immeasurably more powerful of an impression. John Power's generation at the Art Academy was a middle generation. There was no natural talent for leadership and the majority of students with a more radical attitude preferred to attend the School of the Artists Association rather than the School of History Painting, which permeated the Academy. In his second year there, John wanted to quit. He felt that the constant drawing from models and casts was not sufficiently developing. But Professor Sederstrom wrote home to John's father and emphasized how important it was that John continue to study art and that this should take place at the Academy. John was therefore not approved by his father when he asked to leave the Academy. For John Bauer, none of his fellow artists stood out as a role model. His best friend, Axel Klamer, with whom he sometimes lived during his academic years, was a quiet artist with no ambitious plans. 
John thereby came to look more to the already established artists of his own generation, primarily Larson, Bruno Leoforis, and Anders Zorn. During his first years in Stockholm, John wrote the editor of Sondas Nisa, a popular satirical newspaper, and was offered a position as a permanent cartoonist. John also received commission from Bonniers for Christmas book illustrations the same year, and more offers for permanent positions the following year in 1902, but he does not accept them, wanting to choose what he will draw himself. That summer, he traveled to Germany with his father. For just over a month, John toured German cities paying attention to the medieval architecture, romantic German artists, and other works in the German museums. There is no mistaking that the trip gave him inspiration to continue in the spirit of medieval romanticism. In diary entries and letters, enthusiasm overflows in the medieval cities, especially Rothenburg. I've been out all day painted three watercolor sketches. The city wall stands as before with bricks and walkways. I've been hiccuping with joy all day. The impression of the Middle Ages is so strong that you have to knock on the old walls to confirm that it is reality. Works by Durer, Bachlin, and Max Klinger made a particularly strong impression on John. He considered his sculptures in Leipzig as downright wonderful. They are alive. Michelangelo looks so clumsy next to Klinger. At the turn of the century in 1900, Lapon was thrust into the limelight due to the incipient exploitation of the rich iron ore deposits. Previously, Lapland had particular folkloric interests through the distinctive Sami culture, the exotic wilderness, and the midnight sun in the summertime. When the book publisher C.A.V. Lundholm decided to publish a great masterpiece about Lapland at his publishing house, it was a manifestation of the new popular Lapland. Lundholm engaged a number of artists for illustrations for the work. Among others, the well-established Sami painter Carl Tyron, landscape painters Alfred Thorne, and Haljamar Lindquist. The youngest among the artists that one home contacted was John Bauer. The publisher was impressed by the recently commissioned work for Gustav Freuding's poem, An Old Mountain Troll. John Bauer spent just over a month in Lapland and tried to bring the Sami population into life. He worked with pencil drawings and watercolors and made sketches and detailed drawings of tools, costumes, and objects. The trip to Lapland forever left a mark on Bauer's art. He constantly returned to the rich collection of folkloric traits that he found in detail. Reindeer and wolf skins reappear as materials in the trolls' robes. The hood of the Sami clothing, pointed jackets, and wide belt with the curved knife from part of the artist's fantasy wardrobe. One biographer even commented that Bauer had accrued a natural mysticism with his close contact of Lapland's nature and people. The Lapland book was not published until 1908, and in it, 11 of John's watercolors are reproduced. He came back to Stockholm and in the student body at the academy there was a young blonde girl who, with her curly light hair and cheerful laugh, captivated John. Esther Elquist, who is no stranger to artistry, would soon become his wife. In the letters to Esther from 1903 onwards, John reveals his innermost thoughts, and you can follow his struggle for self-realization in the years up to his wedding anniversary in 1906. Esther became John's top model. In the summer of 1904, they stayed together in Stockholm Sagord, and there he painted Esther standing on a lava-covered mountain with a birch forest in the background beneath sunlit clouds. In this Nordic landscape, Esther stands in profile, dressed in a wide dress, with a red cloak hanging over her shoulders and back. It is not only a portrait of Esther Elquist, but also the ideal image of the woman, as John Bauer wanted her to be, pure, innocent, and elevated. Her monumental figure and her gaze resting in an unknown distance are those of the goddess. The picture is entitled The Fairy Tale Princess. 
In a series of sketches around 1905, he gives a more casual picture of himself as a painter out in the wintry forests or on a walk with his beloved dachshund, the boy. Author Ulvi Eklund described John Bauer's profile. Bauer had a rather large, aristocratic crook and actually quite a handsome nose. The brown hair was curly and from the corner of his mouth dangled a little brown pipe, which seemed to have been a permanent fixture. But what the previous quote does not describe and what is not displayed is the uncertain artist in his self-portraits. He hid that side from others and willingly also from himself. During the years 1906 to 1907, John Bauer received many commissions including book covers, posters, and even business logos. While married to Esther, John continued to find as many sales opportunities as possible. Though he dreamed of a future as a great oil painter. He worked these years mainly as an illustrator and also as artistic advisor to publishers. As an example, he participated in the layout celebrating the Christmas holiday the atmosphere being called in Norwegian, Yule Les Stemming. In April 1908, John, with his father Peng, arranged for a longer study trip abroad. Together with his wife, he traveled to Italy. The journey went through Germany, where together with Esther, he relived the memories of the German Middle Ages. In Italy, they visited Verona, Florence, Siena, stayed for a few months in Volterra, traveled to Naples and Capri, and lived during the winter in Rome. John Bauer's sketchbooks from the trip are few, and although he did some illustration work during his stay in Italy, it was primarily a time for studying other art and mainly the works of antiquity, the Middle Ages, and the Renaissance. I've simply never seen anything so beautiful before. Despite their primitive, stylized simplicity, it's amazing what character they can put into their figures. Their paintings look like jewelry. It was never their intention to paint realistically. They have entered a completely different world of beauty. Unfortunately, a murder committed in the same building where John and Esther stayed in Rome interrupts their vacation. John is called for questioning by the Italian police due to a misunderstanding and the situation has given great publicity, making an unpleasant aftertaste to the stay in Rome. In 1907, John was commissioned to illustrate a new fairy tale collection among gnomes and trolls. During the years 1907 to 1915, he illustrated this collection of stories with a circulation of about 100,000 copies. Among gnomes and trolls made John Bauer a household name in almost every Swedish home. John's great contribution to Swedish art became the illustrations for Among Gnomes and Trolls. In this work, he had the opportunity to portray the world of fairy tales, not only stemming from his experiences in the Lapland, but from John's own youth as well. Trolls can be found early in John's art, and his forest illustrations were sometimes filled with fantasy creatures. The characterization of trolls in Gustav Freuding's poem, An Old Mountain Troll, can also be found in John's trolls. They never scared a child, but instead played in a good-natured but small-minded way always allowing themselves to be deceived by the noble princes. John's trolls were not only for the excitement of children, but for adults as well. Inciting a time when man and nature was close, when the darkness in the forest always gave opportunity for the imagination, a romantic warmth of nature and the respect for the creatures that inhabit the great forest, making John's folk art a treasure of richness. When the assignment came to illustrate Among Gnomes and Trolls, John was well prepared. He had a particular technique for his illustrations, first by composing all the images in open sketches in black and white in miniature. Then, after enlarging the sketches to about 3 by 3 inches, he carefully introduced the color. At this point, he used whatever papers were at hand. Cardboard, letters, envelopes, margins of newspapers. Finally, he arrived at the right size for the illustrations, about 9 inches. He made many copies to test variations. In 1911's editions, John did not submit the illustrations for Among Gnomes and Trolls. The reason was because the publisher, Eric Ackerland, 
had kept John's original illustrations. When John Bauer made it a condition that the originals would be his property, the publisher turned to the Dane, Louis Moe. But the sales dropped alarmingly and Eric Ackerland rehired John for Christmas. The illustrations for Among Gnomes and Trolls dominated the work, but also a series of other assignments with book covers and Christmas newspaper pictures provided full employment and a good income. John often traveled to Stockholm during this time, but Esther usually stayed in their home in Smallland, and her sense of isolation became strong. After a couple of winters in Smallland, they lived in Stockholm during the winter, and John made contacts with a circle of artists, primarily Siggy Bernström, Eric Lang, Torsten Stublis, all belonging to the middle generation that worked in the style of national romanticism. But John also gained acquaintances with the old ones, Carl Larson, Zorn, Prince Eugene, and Schultzberg. A friendship developed between John and Carl Larson, whom John visited and stayed with at Sunborn. In 1915, Carl Larson wrote the foreword to John's series of lithographs, Troll. Larson says about Bauer's art, Bauer was something of the best in me, myself, and I loved the young artist as if he were my son. In 1913, John Bauer exhibited for the first time in Stockholm. The criticism was positive, the audience was interested, and the National Museum, who had already bought two watercolors in 1911, now bought more of the illustrations. In a review of the exhibition, August Brunus writes, It is undoubtedly original, but at the same time connected with an international type of drawing, which has emerged from the modern methods of reproduction. This art of illustration is not 10 years old. Its most familiar representative is the Englishman Rackham, who recently obtained a rival in the elegant Dulac. In contrast to these, Bauer is more monochrome and has a fuller, less fantastical style. His trolls have the same attachment to Nordic nature as Werenskolds, murky and stubble-like and covered in moss. Sometimes in the subject you can think of Kittleson, but it is rare that one thinks of someone other than Bauer himself. The exhibition in 1913 marked a breakthrough for John Bauer as a freelance artist. The 1913-1915 editions of Among Gnomes and Trolls were a pinnacle of quality, and a drawing course was established by John for Sweden's school children. Educationally spirited, John wrote a compendium about the modern methods of illustrations and gave lessons on the importance of the development of beauty. When the drawing course published in 1913, he worked on the sketches for a fresco painting in the Oddfellow House in Nee Serping that was to be carried out after a drawing by architect Ragnar Ostberg. John Bauer was strongly interested in theater. On every visit to Stockholm, he went to the theater and in his circle of acquaintances always included actors and theater hands. The interest in the stage room with acting people is also found in his illustrations and not least in his drafts for monumental paintings. During the Russian ballet, master Mikhail Foykin stay in Stockholm in 1913-1914, John Bauer came into contact with him. John Bauer gave Foykin the idea for a ballet with motifs from his own fairy tale world, a world that was completely in line with Foykin's ethnographic interests. At the same time he started working with the ballet, he designed costumes for a fairy tale play, The Princess Who Didn't Want to Eat Oat Soup, written by Walter Stenstrom, and performed by a children's theater group at the Intima Theater. And in the summer of 1915, he wrote a fairy tale play. Mats and Peter and the Princess Who Got the Trolls. The plot is similar to the classic fairy tale with the handsome boy who, after some adventures and daring feats, wins the princess and half the kingdom. John Bauer's costumes connected directly to the illustrations in Among Gnomes and Trolls. The play was a great success and John received an offer to become an artistic advisor at the New Blanche Theatre. 
Despite the success, John was constantly feeling a strong concern about the inadequacy of his own work, as well as a dissatisfaction with his duties. He experienced the praise for his work as a pat on the back for making funny pictures for children. But John had ambitions to create a synthesis between reality and unreality. John's worries artistically were compounded by his worries domestically. The couple were often away from each other for a long time. The letters from Esther speak for themselves. John, I have done nothing wrong to you. My wounded pride made me want to wake up and see the care in someone else that you denied me. In 1914, they bought a beautiful house near Grana. Son Banked was born this year and there seems to be restored happiness in the family. However, the following year in 1915, John stopped illustrating for Among Gnomes and Trolls. Esther wanted to move to Stockholm so that she could resume her painting. John agreed to her request and they had built a villa, but he himself did not intend to move there. In a letter to Esther in the spring of 1918, he informed Esther he wanted a divorce, a conclusion John had already found the previous summer to be the only possibility. He was deeply depressed, was not happy about the direction of his career, and in a letter tells of a perceived inadequacies as a husband and father. I know that I am far from healthy and that my ability to work has become sadly small and I don't want to be forced to create weak art for money. Paradoxically, color took an increasingly prominent place in his art. Many art critics pointed out the scarce color in his earlier work and believed that his gift for color was subordinate to his sense of form. His last painting, Eve, has a lyrical soft tone and is fantastically visionary. On November 20th, 1918, John, together with Esther and their son, left their summer home. Anxious to be allowed to come to Stockholm, Esther had packed and managed a large part of the arrangements in the week before. John, meanwhile, planned to stay in Copenhagen, where he was commissioner for a Swedish exhibition, and also to visit with artist friend Siggy Bergström. It was a stormy autumn night that the family walked slowly down to the harbor after spending a few hours with the artist banked Heidberg in the city. The narrow canal boat, per bra, was heavily loaded with goods. Although the storm increased, the boat left the harbor at 11 o'clock in the evening with 16 crewmen and eight passengers. When the boat did not arrive at the destination in the morning of the next day, investigations were carried out and soon the wreckage was washed ashore. The boat had tossed around in the severe storm and immediately sank to the bottom with the heavy load. None of those on board had been able to escape and all 24 on board perished. Four years later, the ship was salvaged. The most bizarre scenes occurred during the salvage, which became a major public attraction. The boat was later shown for a fee. John Bauer's dramatic death gave rise to a superstition about the gnomes and trolls that he illustrated. Thank you.